This lecture is regarding basic intracranial hemorrhage. My name is Patrick Farley. I work as a radiologist at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. The objectives, we want to learn about the types of intracranial hemorrhages, the key imaging differentiators, and how to accurately identify and report the hemorrhages. Intracranial hemorrhages can be of multiple etiologies. The history is very important, particularly finding out if they're spontaneous or traumatic. Traumatic hemorrhages may be epidural, subdural, subarachnoid, or intraparenchymal. And intraparenchymal hemorrhages may reflect contusion injury or diffuse axonal injury. Epidural hemorrhages are classically related to injury to the middle meningeal artery. The hemorrhage is located between the dura and inner table of the calvarium. These hemorrhages appear lentiform and hyperdense on CT. A skull fracture is often present, but not always. These hemorrhages should not cross the suture lines which helps distinguish epidural hemorrhages from subdural hemorrhages. Venous epidurals can also occur, but they are less common. It's common. This is an epidural hemorrhage. This is a five-year-old who had a TV fall on his head. We can see that the hemorrhage is somewhat lentiform in shape. We can see that it does cross the uh, falx anteriorly and uh, it does not cross that coronal suture. Small foci of error present reflecting pneumocephalus and there is a linear skull fracture seen on the 3D uh, rendering of the Acute subdural hematomas are another hemorrhage. This blood is located in the potential space between the dura and the arachnoid. It's due to shearing of the bridging veins and those appear crescentic and hyperdense acutely on CT. They may cross the sutures but they will not cross the falx, cerebrio, or tentorium. This helps distinguish these from epidural hematomas. This is a subdural hematoma. We can see that there is a right uh, whole hemispheric crescentic hyperdense collection, and it is causing a bit of midline shift and mass effect. Here is another acute subdural hematoma. Again, we can see that it's on the uh, right aspect of the falx and the right tentorium. We can see here that, uh, again, it does not cross the tentorium or cross the falx. Chronic subdural hematomas are hypodense compared to brain parenchyma. They're more common in older patients where increased atrophy allows the bridging veins to tear more easily. If there is hyperdense material within the subdural, uh, this may reflect that it's acute on chronic. and, and you'd want to do follow-up imaging to assess for change if the patient's neurologically stable and doesn't need to immediately go to the operating room. Here's a chronic subdural hematoma. As we can see, it is hypodense and it does cross the area of the coronal suture between the frontal and parietal bones. There is mass effect, there is midline shift, and we can see that the right temporal horn of the lateral ventricle is dilated, reflecting ventricular megaly uh, and a trapped ventricle. Cerebral contusions occur in trauma. They may be coup at the site of injury or contra coup where they're opposite the site of injury. That's where the brain slams into the skull. Usually they're at the brain skull interfaces, inferior frontal lobes, anterior and inferior temporal lobes. Contusions may be of mixed density. The high density is the blood, the low density is the edema, and they often get bigger over time. Here's a hemorrhagic contusion in the left frontal lobe. This was traumatic. We can see the central hyperdensity reflecting the hemorrhage, and we can see, particularly on the coronal, surrounding hypodensity reflecting edema. Diffuse axonal injury is another source of intracranial hemorrhage and trauma. It's due to acceleration and deceleration, where you get shearing of the axons, often at the gray white interface. The splenium of the corpus callosum is also very susceptible, and these may be hemorrhagic. And if large enough, we can see them on CT or non-hemorrhagic where MRI is needed to see them. If an MRI is performed, it will show far more areas of diffuse axonal injury on CT. Here's a small area of diffuse axonal injury that is hemorrhagic. We can see hyperdensity in the left frontal lobe at the gray-white junction. Subsequent MR showed additional areas. Traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage also occurs. Hemorrhage is located in the sulci. This may be more localized uh, to the sites of trauma. You can also get traumatic intraventricular hemorrhage. And anytime you do have intraventricular hemorrhage, one must assess the 
ventricles to look for ventriculomegaly and hydrocephalus, which needs to be Here's traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. We can see in the sulci, uh, particularly in the right frontal lobe, areas of hemorrhage uh, that extend down uh, into the sulci. There's also a small subdural in the uh, left hemisphere. Non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage is something that must be assessed and one needs to look for an underlying vascular abnormality. The fastest test is a CTA. You're looking for aneurysms or other vascular abnormalities. And again, if there's intraventricular extension for hydrocephalus. Here we see hemorrhage in the supracellar cistern and we see a little bit more of the hemorrhage extending into the sulci in the region of the left sylvian fissure. This was non-traumatic. CTA was performed. We can see that there's abnormality in the region of the left middle cerebral artery bifurcation on both the axial and coronal, and this is a ruptured MCA aneurysm. Non-traumatic intraparenchymal hemorrhages also occur. These may be hypertensive in nature. The basal ganglia and thalami are most commonly involved. One must assess for underlying uh, lesions if the Appearance is not characteristic of a hypertensive type hemorrhage, and in that case, you'd be looking for tumors, vascular abnormalities, underlying diseases like amyloidosis, and MRI or CTA would likely be used. This is a classic hypertensive hemorrhage. It's located in the left basal ganglia. There is surrounding edema. Here's another hypertensive type hemorrhage in the thalamus with intraventricular extension. And here we can see that the temporal horns are starting to enlarge, reflecting uh, developing ventriculomegaly slash hydrocephalus. Regarding intracranial hemorrhage, the history and mechanism are extremely important. Eric, accurate characterization of the type of hemorrhage is vital in managing the hemorrhage appropriately. You certainly want to assess for mass effect and ventriculomegaly and often further evaluation will be needed with CTA or MRI.